Tape Projection. It's Friday afternoon, and you know what that means. It means that we're late getting the Alabama Slam podcast up and running. And this week, we apologize, guys. We've been uh, working, working real hard. My name's Corey Hanna. What's up, guys? It's Patrick Akers. And, uh, yeah, we apologize for being late. We had some work issues yesterday, and we were gone since about 5.45 a.m. this morning and just got back. It is about 4 o'clock p.m., and we're going to get this uh released as quickly as we can this afternoon so let's let's jump right into it patrick wants to jump uh in and talk about some some wwe happenings from last week i I watched a little bit of smackdown myself in anticipation i thought bray wyatt was going to be back friday with all the white rabbit teases and they fucked me (laughs) (laughs) they're keeping it going they're just teasing you yeah but i just just teasing you oh nine two three oh nine two three had me (laughs) Uh, so I was watching, and they went to fuck a break. And I texted Patrick. I said, "Hey, what happened? Why they're why are they in a goddamn commercial break? I thought this white rabbit shit was happening at nine twenty three, which would have been eight twenty three Central our time." And he said, "Bro, you missed it. There was a QR code already in the background." Yep. So they're running with these QR codes. I think this is brilliant. This is absolutely fantastic stuff it's it's real smart whoever's in absolutely charge of it. it's smart and it just goes to show that like the audience doesn't want the audience will work for what you give them if what you're giving them is something interesting sure like i think the old regime of the wwe maybe force-fed a lot of stuff to the audience or maybe thought that they had to over explain things to the audience it's like, no, you can literally just put a QR code up, not even mention it on the broadcast, and somebody's going to have that bitch scanned and up on the internet in five minutes. And now you have all these crazy fan theories, you know. My gosh, it's run through the gamut. Some people thought it was Edge, and then Edge came back, and some people looked into, like, some code and saw that it was Aleister Black's uh, theme music, and, of course, we know what he's doing now with AEW, so they're like, is he going to come back? Here's the thing, though. They've, they've booked themselves into a pickle because it, it literally has to be Bray Wyatt or yeah, it's yeah. going to be a disappointment. Yeah, everybody's going to be pissed if it ain't. And I think it will be. I mean, right, don't you think? It's got to be. This is, boy, if it's anybody but, you, we're going to, I'm going to laugh so hard because that's such a miscalculation of what you think people were going to be expecting yeah and and what they'll be able to put up with because wasn't one of the clues last week you said there was like two something about two things in one city and one of them was a something about a hotel by Wyndham or something <laughs> yeah shit. so one of the zip codes of the latest one was uh and they'll you know smackdown is will be on tonight so chances are there's probably something else that'll be up there but i think the one that had the corbin kentucky um Corbin is, I think, somebody found out was the last opponent that Bray Wyatt had before he turned into the Fiend. And then when you look at what's in Corbin, Kentucky, there's a White Rabbits or a White Rabbit Records, and there's a, a some kind of a Wyndham, like a, a Baymont by Wyndham, like the the Wyndham hotel chains. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Bray Wyatt's real name Wyndham Rotunda, so all signs point to that. Um, it has to be him because he's the only type of guy that you would feel like puts this much emphasis into his character and has been like literally just sitting there <laughs> thinking about what to do and how to make this cool. So, but, uh, you know, just this idea, I mean, playing the music at the live events before anybody knew anything, not saying anything on the broadcast, putting a QR code up, like it's just, it's ingenious level stuff that, uh, you know, whenever he comes walking down the ramp, whether it's if it's extreme rules here in the next couple of weeks, if it's at Survivor Series, whenever, however long they stretch, it sure as fuck out. wasn't it. Eight twenty three on nine twenty three last week. <laughs> My ass was watching. <laughs> it was a good SmackDown show. Yeah, though. it was fun. I, tur- I, I would, it was fun. I did tune in, and I texted you. I was like, "Well, I just tuned in and saw uh, fucking Braun Strowman power slam." Uh, uh, Otis. Otis, so that yeah. was fun. So see, they got you. Like that's yeah, how they get you. I mean, you. I was in. So like, and then then I watched the, <laughs> the honorary ooze. and that's what we'll talk about next. Yeah. So the White Rabbit stuff is is fantastic. Uh, 
But the best thing happening in wrestling right now is the honorary Oos, Sami Zayn, and his affiliation with the Bloodline. This is like the reason I want to talk about this first and the reason we're starting. I think this is the first time we've ever started the podcast in 19 something episodes with WWE. We other t- than other than the Vince then like shit. New, yeah rumors and news and shit because smackdown right now is the best wrestling program currently running and Sami Zayn is the best professional wrestler in the world right now because he has made literally everybody care about this storyline like if you boil this down if it's not executed properly this is the dumbest hokiest corniest shit on television instead it's the most compelling it's the funniest it's potentially going to be heartbreaking when the turn finally happens and the bloodline does turn on Sami Zayn and kick him out but like that opening segment however long it was I don't know if there was a better piece of television across any kind of genre be it professional wrestling drama comedy anything in the world last week than that opening segment so i missed the opening because i didn't tune in until a little after eight so what what happened in the so opening? they've set up everything so like paul Heyman got the mic here's here's what you have to need the context behind this everybody believes that it's probably going to be roman reigns versus the rock at wrestlemania i mean they've been setting it up for two years they've been setting it up so paul Heyman gets on the mic he you know he puts over roman reigns being the champion uh, he puts over Solo Sokoa saying that, like, the elders sent him to ensure Roman's um, title reign continues. So this that's a cool little wrinkle in it, like the elders. Like, you know, we all know the, the Samoan legacy in professional wrestling. So if they do, you know, at some point here before WrestleMania debut, like the, this elder Samoan council, like that's going to be a cool uh, cool gimmick. Uh, but they put, over, they put over Solo. He acknowledges Roman Reigns. Obviously, they go to turn away. Sammy grabs the mic to just a huge applause. I mean, you want to talk about, like, is he a heel right now? Not really. Like, he's in a heel group, I guess, if you want to put it that. But, like, the audience is chanting for Roman Reigns. Like, you can – Sammy may be aligned with the heel group, but he's not a heel. Like, he is a a babyface through and through. And, of course, Sammy gets on the mic and – does his thing and then you see the turn the roman being like why are you talking take the shirt off and it's like you know we don't talk a lot about uh someone's acting ability in wrestling like we talk about oh they're good at doing the moves they're a good promo all this sort of stuff but like you do kind of have to be a good actor and so when roman looks at sammy and just smiles it's like why are you talking right now and the whole energy turns and that building was just like, please don't do it. Like, don't do this now. And he tells him to take off the shirt. And Jey Uso is just on the nut. His, his level of acting ability right now is on another level. He is like a crazed lunatic. He rips the shirt off of Sammy. Sammy's standing there looking like a, a, a you know, defeated, kicked puppy. And then the, the moment when Roman throws him the shirt, says, you ain't never going to wear that Bloodline shirt again because I got you a new one. And it says, honorary Uso. Like, again, like... This should not be as good as what it is. Just in a nutshell, right? If you just laid it out like, yeah, Sammy with Roman Reigns, like, and it, this is what it's going to be. But it's, like, fantastic. So, so who is backstage and is like, I think I got a good idea? I don't know who whoever's idea this was and who has shepherded this thing. Because this is for months now they've built this story up. And they have just done it at each individual thing. They've added wrinkle after wrinkle. I mean, the bloodline stuff with Roman Reigns has been going on for two years now. At yeah, this but point. I'm talking about like the who's who. Who was like, I, I don't think, know. I think we should make we should make Sami Zayn an honor, honorary use. It. I mean, whoever. It's it is you know a plus fantastic. Uh, it got me thinking though. Like after this whole segment, and this has been universally loved. Like everybody on wrestling Twitter has talked about this segment because it's been that good. Like. You know, I mentioned before we started talking, the expectation is that we're going to do Roman versus The Rock at WrestleMania, right? But with this being a new regime, the Triple H era, whatever you want to call it, if the old era of WWE in the past, say, 10 years has been characterized by these storylines and these characters that people really love and invest a lot of time in, being chopped off at the knees 
for a, a, a Brock Lesnar to return or a Goldberg or anything like this. Why would this new regime not want to put a stop to that? Like, like why, why are we not just going to do Roman and Sammy at WrestleMania? Like, that should headline WrestleMania, right? This is the best thing that WWE has going. I'm not really interested in seeing Roman Reigns versus The Rock, personally. But if if Roman's reign of uh, at the top here, if it's going to be toppled by anybody, it, that is a prime moment to turn somebody into a mega, mega superstar. Let it just be Sami Zayn. Roman versus Sami at WrestleMania, Sami Zayn I don't think I don't think WWE's got the balls to try that right now. But why? But why not though? Like, like then, then this is then this is no different than what we've done in the past. What Vincent Rand has done in the past decade. True. Other than the fact that you know it's got kind of like a different coat of paint on it, and there's better matches during the week. But like, if we're still just going to do the equivalent of like Kevin Owens getting beat by Goldberg, in terms of like Roman just. Roman and the Rock is just going to happen, and we're going to just bypass this story that we've been telling for months. That's been not only the best thing in our programming, but the best thing in wrestling. Period. Like that seems like a complete missed opportunity, and it seems like that's not. It's not really that much different than where we've been in the past. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I just don't think they'll do it. Personally, I mean, they they could, and it would be a smart move. But I mean, the money maker, for if you want to call it that, is going to be having the Rock face face Roman at, at Mania because Mania is supposed to be your biggest event of the year. I mean, maybe they could, maybe they could do the Rock and Roman at Mania and then turn around and let SummerSlam happen and then do Sami Zayn because people that don't typically watch wrestling might tune in and watch mania right right i don't know man i'm i'm just like i said it is you know ha- seeing the runs of like biggie and kofi kingston and kevin owens and the fiend like all these championship runs just die at the hands of like these either part-time guys or, or it just if that's what the old administration was doing, it seems like you have a, a a good opportunity here to run in a different direction. Change the game. Change the game. Like if you're gonna say that this is different, then we actually need to be different. It can't just be that, oh, you know, Monday and Friday the the match qualities are better, and we let guys wrestle for five more minutes. You know, it actually needs to be something different. And it needs to be something different in a in a big time type of way, not just like, oh, Kevin Owens is. It's cool again, and we're gonna give him uh, some more stuff to do during the during the television show. Yeah, uh, but so you got uh, other WWE stuff you want to touch on before we jump? So we hit what do we hit? White Rabbit. We hit the opening promo, Sami Zayn. Uh, oh, another thing from SmackDown last week, and of course we're a week behind because SmackDown's gonna air tonight, and there'll be something different. I'm all in on this Maximum Male Models. I wasn't at the beginning. I was like, this is stupid, but they have just. It, it's stupid, but if you stay with it, you'll get the audience on your side. And that's what they've done with me. Like, the more over the top these two guys can be, the better it's going to be. Now, I don't know what the, the height of this gimmick looks like. I don't know if it looks like a, you know, World Tag Team Champions or anything like that. But they are <laughs> just doing consistently funny stuff. The 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 double shoulder tackles and then they turn away from the camera and then dramatically turn back to the camera great stuff the the way they tag with just using their fingers like <laughs> little t- I haven't t- seen any of that little tiny one. things or, or what you know we talk about it all the time it's wrestling's a variety show you need all all kinds of different stuff everybody can't be a world champion everybody can't can't and doesn't need to be super serious wrestler right you need these comedic elements and man, these two dudes are, are knocking it out of the park. It also helps that they look physically intimidating, right? I think the one dude was a former NFL player, so they look like they could for real, legit kick your ass. But yet they're in mess t mess uh, t shirts and super short shorts, 
<laughs> and they have the hair and they're doing this stuff so i'm all in on that and then from raw from this past monday you know we talk about it being different um they just let Bianca Belair and EO Sky just have like a, a brilliant 15 minute match where they tore the house down. Bianca Belair is just, she is a absolute superstar. Uh, and everything about her, her hair is cool. Her gear is cool. Um, her punches for a woman look absolutely vicious. Like the way she was laying that stuff in on EO Sky what are you saying, man? in the corner. I'm just saying that a lot of times women don't wrestle like that and right. historically haven't wrestled like that. And even for like people like Becky and Charlotte and, and uh, you know, obviously I'm blanking on a couple other people, but Bailey, the four horsewomen, that kind of thing, Asuka, they've really elevated women's wrestling in a way. But like Bianca, I think, is even taking it to another level with just like the – and it's hard to make punches like that look convincing. She looked like she was legit beating the shit out of EO Sky in the corner with those punches. And, like, I'm just, you're just not used to seeing that. And then EO Sky and Damage Control, I'm all in on that group too. I think that's really cool. I think WWE right now is seriously outpacing AEW. Not to say anything that there's anything bad about AEW, and we'll, we'll get into some critiques from Grand Slam and Dynamite here in a little bit, but, like, if you want to give a belt to one of these companies who's putting on the best professional wrestling right now, it is WWE. Like, they're making it work. The storylines, the um, not necessarily the action in the ring, because like we talk about, it's just different styles. Uh, but the way these stories and these matches are seemingly meaning more in WWE than they are in AEW. Um you know, and competition is good. It makes both of these uh, companies better. And then Dexter Loomis, I mean, still just terrorizing. I mean, is and bro, he popped out. He was a fucking statue this week, and he choked him out in the thing. Like it's it is whoever did who whoever's doing the Sami Zayn stuff, and whoever came up with this Dexter Loomis gimmick, like just give this person the pencil for literally everything because these are two. Two things that, like like I said, just shouldn't work on paper that are so compelling and captivating. The Dexter Loomis stuff is straight out of like a B-level horror movie just with its campiness. But instead of like the camp being a turnoff to you, the campiness of it is what is drawing you in. Like basically what it was like is somebody had to watch like Halloween and was just like, hey, what if fucking Michael Myers was like a good guy? And what if Jamie Lee Curtis was the, the bad person that we all wanted to see get hacked to death? Like, what if we just flipped it? Uh, yeah, he popped out of a fucking... <laughs> he was a hockey statue and then choked out Miz. Like, I don't know where this goes. The dude still hasn't spoken a word. And I don't know how long, much longer they can keep this up. If he pops out of a cake next week, I'm for real going to lose my shit. If there's a damn, like, celebration birthday party and <laughs> Dexter Loomis pops out of it like Marilyn Monroe, that's the only thing left they have to the only barrier they got to clear is can he pop out of a food yet and hell i've only started watching wwe for a couple weeks so he might have already popped out of a cake i don't even know yeah um but yeah that's those are big takeaways i'm not a fan of judgment day still they're like running monday night raw i will say monday night raw really is lacking from not having a world champion on their program consistently you know, because Roman is kind of exclusively to SmackDown. He will show up on Raw every once in a while. But, you know, there was that whole thing a couple of weeks ago where, like, the USA Network wants their own champion. Cause, so they're kind of in a pickle because they've built Roman to be this unbeatable heel, and he sure. has both titles. And so how are they going to, you know, extract one of those titles away from him? So uh, they have some booking decisions coming up. But, uh, yeah, the, the, Raw is still good, but it definitely needs a, a – a world title to kind of anchor that show i think that in a way that like smackdown has so yeah that's the wwe report <laughs> uh yeah it's uh i'm in like kudos to them they have they've pulled me back in all the way it's a lot of wrestling to watch every week that is a lot of wrestling but you know you can skip a lot of the matches like i don't need as for as cool as what braun Strowman and otis is i kind of just fast forward to the finish right <laughs> yeah. and that's what i do with a lot of these matches like Bianca and Io Sky, I watched the whole thing. Yeah. But for a lot of them, you can just kind of go to the finish and see if anything happens. Because, um, like I said, there's just a there's a distinct WWE style 
where you know nothing too crazy is going to happen on the matches. Whereas in AEW, you don't know what the like for good and for bad. You don't know what the fuck's yeah, going to happen. Anything could happen. Anything, yeah. So, yeah. So speaking of AEW, last week uh, was uh, Friday Night Rampage was the s- continuation of Grand Slam, and it was a two hour show. So there's a bunch of stuff here. We'll probably only uh, really talk about a, a couple of these and maybe skip a couple. And we'll just see what happens here. Um, so started off the show with Darby Allen and Sting versus Brody King and Buddy Matthews. Uh, with Julia Hart was there, <clears throat> and uh, looked like she might have busted her head at one point. Um, she says she's okay. Might have seen the last of Buddy Matthews in AEW. Um, I mean, who the hell knows? Yeah, I mean, who knows? Because Tony Khan saying he's not giving anybody a release. I'm, we've talked about dirt sheet stuff and rumor stuff before. I think at this point I'm 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 kind of just out on all that stuff. I'm just gonna watch the shows. Whoever's there is there, because you don't know so these dirt sheet guys say this is actually one way. Then the performers themselves are like this. No, it actually like the Malachi stuff all came to a head this week. Where basically the dude's supposed to be on vacation or like taking some time off, and he's got to hop on Instagram Live and like put all these rumors to bed. Yeah. Uh, and even Buddy Matthews was like, I, who said I was leaving? He was like, I'm just taking some time off, too, like Malachi said yeah. he was doing. So, like, I'm just going to like, whatever happens. We'll, obviously, we'll talk of anything big, like, for sure, kind of, like, breaks out. But I'm, I would kind of just rather talk about the shows, right? right? And, like, what's being put in front of the camera. Yeah. So, so the other surprise element, or not the other, but the surprise element of that whole situation in that match was that the end of it, uh, the great Muta came out great muta this was so fucking cool it's just yeah. for for like people that here's the thing for people that know and know the history between sting and, and muta like it's it's a fucking cool ass moment to see these two guys these two legends actually of professional wrestling like have a moment inside an american ring again for the first time in whatever you know 30 something years and if you don't know the cool thing about it is that, like, you can be like, oh, shit, who's this guy? He looks cool. It's a cool mask. And then you go on the internet and you read everything that happened, right? And you go on fucking Peacock and try to find, or you go on the internet, whatever, and find the matches. Like, I, all of wrestling should do this more. WWE has not gotten on board with this just yet. I'll, although I think with Triple H now in charge, it'll be better. I do think modern day wrestlers and modern day wrestling companies have a responsibility to educate the current day audience on the history of the art form and the people who have influenced it and got it to where it is today. So that's why you bring a guy like Muta in who's in the last year of his career, he's going to retire, and you bring him in and you put him in this fucking huge ass moment at this huge stadium in front of thousands of people and let him have this moment. Yeah, and if you know like Buddy Matthews is fixing to take some time off, let let him get hit with the green mist and then And also dip for a it's while. cool for these performers. You don't think Buddy Matthews was fucking ecstatic, ecstatic when they told him like, yeah. "Hey, here's the finish to the match by the way, like <laughs> this fucking Japanese wrestling legend who everybody has stolen shit from and has been influenced by is going to miss you like that's the that's the end of it like he'd have to be like oh well fuck yeah like (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty awesome you know so yeah yeah, i I just you know we didn't even talk about this i think it's a month ago at this point you know triple h his little comment saying that like you know wrestling was in bars and in bingo halls before vince took it to the these arenas and stuff which is just uh a blatant lie if not uh you know just outright propaganda on wwe's part which is you know something that they are prone to do from time to time to say the least but uh yeah you have to you you need to bring this current day audience along and and let them know about the legends of the past and let them know about the history of the art form and the things that have happened uh i think that's a cool a cool thing that aew has really since their inception been very good about i mean they've brought steamboat in they've brought rock and roll express in uh sting obviously is still doing this stuff yeah uh so yeah it it was it was cool to see so so let's move on because we got a whole bunch to cover uh you got any thoughts on um hook and action bronson versus angelo parker and your boy 
Daddy Magic. Uh, Daddy Magic and Angelo Parker are the shit. <laughs> and Action Bronson was fucking cool. And you could tell he was just having the time of his life in there. Just slinging dudes around. Bro, he was going hard, too. <laughs> he was hitting them ropes with, like, some gusto. Like, he was like, if I got fucking this, if this is the only match I got, I'm going to make use of it. Yeah. So, I thought that was cool. Yeah, um... I mean, I don't know, like, you know, that was a, I'm sure it was a one and done for him. Just an excuse to get him in the ring for a little bit, maybe. Could be. I know we talked about last week, AEW really embracing hip hop culture. Like, this is, you know. Yeah. It, it's a cool, cool moment. Yeah. And then next was uh, Jungle Boy and Ray Phoenix. Um, I, I like that they're, they're showing a little bit of fire with Jungle Boy, or excuse me, with Jack Perry, whatever they're calling him. Now he is Jungle Boy Jack Perry, by the way. Okay. The is graphic has changed completely. I okay. noticed that, yes. Good, finally. <laughs> well, after we've only been saying it since this well, podcast they could still, has been up. They could still lose the boy. They could still be Jungle Jack Perry. I told you, I'm not as... If they want to keep the boy, I'm not, you know, Nature Boy Ric Flair. Sure. I, you know, it'll work. I'll, you know, we can't get everything we want. Yeah, but they're giving him a little fire. Um yeah, you know, I think they're workshopping a little bit. He had a he had an in studio, or not an in studio, but a filmed promo that was on Dynamite this week, and uh, I think they're coaching him up a little bit, man. Um, letting him show some attitude, and uh, maybe get him a little heated for whenever Christian's arm is healed. I figure they'll do a, a a match with him and Luchasaurus sometime between now and then. Yeah, um, let those guys face off before he gets his hands on christian we got a name change or well not a name well yeah a name change for jungle boy can we get a fucking name change for luchasaurus please <laughs> can we just figure something just figure one out what's his real name just call him his name or yeah. something i don't know he can't he can't be a monster heel in a black face mask with a name like luchasaurus it just can't work please do something else yeah um so then Eddie Kingston versus Sammy Guevara uh, finally got that match that we were supposed to see a few weeks ago. Sort of a weird ending that you mentioned. Yeah, this this ending had, had me kind of thrown for a loop. I was like, what is going on? Because, you know, they, so Eddie Kingston wins by submission. Doesn't let go of the submission. The entire AEW officiating crew comes down. Commentary puts over that Paul Turner is the most senior official. He's the head of the officiating crew. Just reverses the decision, which is odd, to say the least. First of all, completely out of left field. They've literally never done this in AEW whatsoever. Yeah, what's the point of that? But, like, then they allude to the like this tweet that Tony sent out that was like, the officiating crew needs to tighten up. Like, we met, Paul, you missed some calls last night in the main event. It's just odd because then, like, they introduced that Friday. Yeah. L- literally didn't follow up at all on Wednesday. Yeah. I I don't know. I couldn't make a lot of sense of it either. Um, I mean, I guess they're we're trying to send a signal about the authority in, in, in AEW now with the officiating or whatever, but... But, like, why? But why, why, why turn over the decision... With what happened in the yeah, ring. why why use this moment to do something like, like it's he not, still won the match like it you can't take that away from him. Well, I mean they did that's exactly that's exactly what they did though like they I reversed mean, can, it and, but, and did the loss like that's what I'm saying it doesn't like but why it just, yeah it seems like it's never like you would just find the guy yeah you wouldn't necessarily reverse the decision take away that dub yeah it's just it was odd and it kind of threw me for a loop and it kind of threw the whole audience for a loop because they were like what like what's happening like we get the security and the referees coming out we've seen that a million times but then for justin roberts to be like per paul turner the decision has been reversed and you're like what what the okay that's weird like we just see guys get fined and get suspended we don't ever see them lose their matches but yeah yeah maybe something will come of it i don't know yeah, who knows? Um, moving on, we got the Golden uh, Ticket Battle Royale. Um, kind of forgettable, except for the fact that Hangman gets the gets the dub in that one. And Bout legitimately got eliminated. Yeah. <laughs> but was able to save it. Yeah. 
that was a that was a cool little moment but i was definitely like oh shit like he's <laughs> and we've seen rumbles like that where shit like that has happened right like what's what's the famous one where was it john cena and batista went over the rope at this like the same time and they had to like they hit both hit at the same time but they weren't supposed to and the referees are like arguing and then vince comes down and that's where he blew out both his quads and he falls down like there's a lot of shit that can go wrong with these guys getting eliminated um but yeah so hangman won also they got a lot of stock in in roosh yeah well they they officially signed him it looks like yeah so he's officially all elite now yeah but like he has been play, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I like the guy, and I think that he should be him and Andrade. If you go check our Twitter account, I fucking have been talking about Andrade here recently, just because like I want to see a luchador Mexican wrestler stable like so bad. You got all these guys like, and they're doing nothing. Uh, but yeah, they have a lot of stock in in Bruce, which is cool to see. I think the dude has a lot of potential. Uh, but he's in there with Hangman, who's one of the originals and one of the biggest stars in the company. And they're the last two guys standing. Like, that's a big deal. Yeah, they always do. They see, They seem like they have some some of the underdogs that hang in on the, the battle royals uh, whenever they do them. You know, we saw Roosh and John Moxley as, when Moxley was champion. Yeah. I don't know. Hopefully it's good signs for Andrade. But then, like, you, you know, we'll... Wednesday night, there's a damn hurricane, and some of the locker room is not there, and yeah. they got all this stuff up in the air, and the dude can't even get on TV for more than thirty seconds. So it's like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Anyway, yeah, uh, that's so, a whole different other conversation we'll have eventually, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll get there. Um, so the the main event for Grand Slam Rampage was uh, Ricky Ricky Starks versus Powerhouse Hobbs in the Lights Out match. Um. Got the got the Ricky got the dub. We're you know we're Team Ricky, and uh, I was happy to see that. I'm not sure it was the match that I really expected or or wanted. I feel like they'll they'll get another shot at each other. Maybe I mean, what do you think? I think the match was fine. I think the the build up to this match really let both of these guys down. Yeah, because it wasn't. There's a scenario where you rewind the clock, and you make Starks versus Hobbs really outside of the main event picture the most anticipated match on this card because yeah. the the rivalry is so white hot they just dropped the ball like and i'm not saying starks and hobbs did at all i think both of those guys did about as well as you could do i think just the booking around them let them down i mean when you have both of these guys barely getting on television after having really the type of betrayal that those two guys had yeah i mean that we talked about that moment like Ricky Starks and Hobbs were on a little bit of a run. Like, one of our podcast episodes was all about Ricky Starks. Like, he was on a hot streak. And then it just kind of – the the turn happened, and we were like, oh, shit, this is going to be great. And then it just kind of fizzled and went nowhere, which really is – a at, at this point, it's becoming kind of commonplace for AEW, right? It's like we have these three-week periods where we're like, holy shit, this show's firing on all cylinders. This is what they should do all the time. And then it usually leads up to a big moment or a big pay-per-view or whatever. And then it just kind of goes, and right back down it goes. Like, we can't be consistent with it where you got the talent and the squad and the kind of real estate here with the expectation that you have from the fans and you have a little bit more freedom than, you know, WWE has. Well, you could really make this thing fucking hum and be like every single week we come in here and we're like holy shit like it's another two hours of did you see dynamite last night it was yeah. fantastic like and it just doesn't happen so yeah. these guys I, I mean they look like stars particularly in their entrances right you know ricky stark's got the the special entrance and hobbs coming up through the middle with that kind of stuff they both look like stars um and it's cool that they main evented you know uh, in an episode of rampage grand slam but they were just really let down by the booking around them because this could have been something really special to watch. Yeah. I feel like they may re- revisit that at some point. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know that we're done with that one just yet. I mean, probably not. You know, we talked about 
AEW having these natural kind of rivalries, uh, Pack and Orange Cassidy. This is another one that you can just do. Yeah. You know, on a random episode of Dynamite, whatever, you can have Starks and and Hobbs in the ring facing off against each other. Yeah. The interesting thing is like, where do these guys go now? From here, yeah. Because neither one was on Dynamite Wednesday. Well, Starks Our, was. well Ricky. Well, Ricky yeah. was in a squash match, but like, yeah. I don't. Again. I, I sound like a fucking broken record at this point. I, I don't need... It. Ricky's main asset is not his wrestling ability. Yeah. I don't need to see him beat up jobbers. Why can't we just take that three-minute match and let him have a microphone and stand in the middle of the ring and deliver a promo? Yeah. That's what he's better at. Like, at some point, you have to put these people in a position where it's like, what does this person do well? Oh, this person's a really great wrestler. Okay, here's 12 minutes. Go do that. Oh, this person is a really great talker okay, we don't really have anything for you. Like, can you give me three and a half minutes, go out there and say something? Like, Yeah, yeah because in a... Uh, we're jumping ahead a little bit. In an episode that was less than stellar for Dynamite, yeah. having him in a squash match did nothing Does to elevate nothing. the show. Where maybe if you give him a microphone and you'd be like, okay, Ricky, like, we don't really know what we're going to do with you yet. But you got three minutes... Go over there and talk about how Hobbs is in the rearview mirror, and now you're on to greener pastures, however you want to do that for three minutes. Yeah. And you might get a nugget in there. He might think of something on the spot while he's in there. Yeah. Boom. Now that becomes the most talked about moment on the show. He's done it before. I'll beat your ass. He did the I'll beat your ass. It was 45 seconds. The greatest thing that was on that show that week. <laughs> like, it's kind of... It's mind-boggling and also at the same time annoying and also at the same time frustrating because you can just see the potential that this company has. And they really do need a riding team. Yeah. I, we've said this from Jump Street. But, like, if this past week of Dynamite wasn't an indication that this show needs a riding team, I don't know if they'll ever you see it. Yeah, well, let, let, let's jump right into that then. For, for Dynamite this week, like like I said just a minute ago, it was a less than stellar episode. We we came we just come off of four to five weeks of just bangers every Wednesday from Dynamite. It could have been that some of the stars couldn't be there because of the weather. Um, there could have been other issues. Could have been lack of focus or writing. But the crowd was fucking dead. The crowd was not feeling it at all. Really, the only time the crowd got hype at all was in the final match. So you start the show off with Jericho Appreciation Society um, celebration, and then you know Danielson comes out to kind of get Garcia's back because they put that little hat on Garcia, and he got fucking mad and was like, "I'm not," you know. Yeah. So then Garcia, or then Danielson's there, <clears throat> and you finally see Garcia being like, "Hey, I ain't taking this shit anymore, and I, I want to have." you know, Danielson in a match against a couple of y'all motherfuckers. But like the crowd is just fucking asleep. Yeah. It was not, was it that or were they mic'd up like not correctly? And, and I don't, and I don't know, but like there were weird audio moments during the show. I mean, I, don't, I it could have been that they just didn't have a good mi mix on it, but like they were sitting just fucking they were just kind of sitting there, yeah, especially the front you can usually tell by like the front row yeah. if the front row standing up that's usually a good indication they were kind of yeah. everybody was I mean, just chilling sort of, sort of sitting down and chilling I just don't know what if they knew what to think of the opening segment you know we put in our on our Twitter a couple weeks ago like if AEW gets more hours of programming what should they do overwhelming majority said they should do a ring of honor show probably for this reason right like last night was just AEW Dynamite Ring of Honor was all it was. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm not saying that that's ne necessarily a terrible thing, but it, it, it absolutely does hurt the product in a, in a different kind of way. Cause you just have these, like the main thing of the show is a title belt that has three letters on it that aren't the three letters that's on the top of the jumbotron <laughs> that everybody's coming out yeah, of. Yeah, you know? and, and now you've got one of your bigger stars in Jericho out there disgracing Ring of Honor. Which I week. like, by the way. I like this angle. Yeah, I mean, it's a good angle. This if, has a lot of legs to it. Yeah. But it's like... Well, it pisses me off as a fan, but it's a good angle. Like, I get yeah, why they're like, doing it. 
and there were some fans that were like, oh, you know, the Ring of Honor, they're whatever, like AEW's just playing with it. Like, you know, they're desecrating about having Jericho be the champion. First of all, Jericho's one of the top 15 greatest wrestlers of all time. Whatever championship he has, he's going to elevate it just because of his status. And also, like, somebody, I was listening to some kind of podcast, a dude who has been watching Ring of Honor since the very start, and he was like, this is the very first angle that Ring of Honor ran. It was at Christopher Daniels back in, like, 2004, was like, I'm not doing the code of honor. I'm going to disrespect this, this, what this wrestling platform has been built on. So, like, this is, like, the most natural story to have for your intro to the company, right? Okay, that's kind of clever. Yeah. Then if they're just, if it's a callback. Yeah, and it's a callback. And, like, what is it going to, like, if we get out of this, like, Samoa Joe versus Chris Jericho, that'll be awesome. If we get Chris Jericho versus... Danielson. Uh, you know, and obviously, like, is it going to lead with Danielson toppling him? Is it going to lead with Daniel Garcia toppling Jericho for the title? Yeah, I mean, I feel that could be the move. And then you got two belts on Garcia. Yeah. And, the, you know, it's a callback to what they did with Danielson. But, like, yeah, you hope that some kind of TV deal is imminent because you could really be using this space for something, that, for a, 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 a Willie Hobbs, for a Ricky Starks. But you're having to chew up a lot of real estate because one of your biggest performers in AEW has this belt. And so you kind of have to do something with it on this show. Yeah, it just, this whole segment needed direction. It's like it went on about four minutes too long. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, we're going to squeeze in this match with Danielson and Daddy Magic now. And I was like, okay, well. Which is funny because, like, the whole time I was watching Dynamite Wednesday night, I was like, this feels like. 2005 Monday Night Raw and that's not a good thing and Monday Night Raw this past week felt a hell of a lot like year one AEW Dynamite where they're just like here's a here's fucking Kevin Owens and Johnny Gargano we're gonna tag here's fucking Sami Zayn and AJ Styles like here's all these motherfuckers just wrestling for 12 minutes and tearing the house down like it had a it had a vibrancy and an energy to it that AEW has had in the past but they just they for whatever reason it just didn't happen this yeah. week. It was a very stale, stale show. Yeah, it was weird. So the next up was uh, MJF and uh, Wheeler Yuta promos, uh, which I thought were pretty good, um, and I think it's going to lead to an interesting first match back for MJF because he hasn't really he hasn't wrestled since he's been back. So yeah, um, I think I think they're setting this up and it's going to be a good match. Uh, you know, we got a little fire out of Wheeler defending his hometown. Yeah. I mean, credit to AEW. AEW, in a short amount of time, has gotten over the acclaimed. They've gotten over Wheeler Yuta. They've gotten over Daniel Garcia. And, you know, a year ago, particularly with Yuta and Garcia, people were like, why is AEW pushing these guys so hard? Like, why is Wheeler Yuta wrestling John Moxie? Why is Daniel Garcia, like, in, like, every fourth main event of Dynamite? It's it's for this reason. Like you got to build new stars. Yeah. And now you come out there, and now a year later, Chris Jericho ain't gonna be here forever. Exactly. And now a year later, Garcia is standing in the ring with Chris Jericho and Brian Danielson, two fucking mega stars. And what's the crowd chanting? They're chanting, "You're a wrestler." To yeah. Daniel Garcia. Wheeler Yuta comes out in his hometown. The whole crowd starts chanting Yuta, and they've done it before. Yeah. And like, yeah, it was a good fire from Yuta. And I mean, we know MJF is just golden on the mic. Like, yeah, he's he's can't miss at this point. He is the Ric Flair of his generation. He's the Ric Flair of this company. Yeah. Like, you know, there are some people though that are critical, and I and I think it this is a fair critique. In that they say like MJF should just cash in the champ. Like he should just be the champion right now. Like if you're gonna do all this return and bring him back, he should have just won the belt instantly. And I could, I could see where that's happening. I think they've done a nice, interesting detour here in that we're trying to save some stuff for pay-per-views. So what can we do in the meantime? Oh, let's take Wheeler Yuta, a guy that we have a lot of stock in, and let's see if MJF can't give him a little bit of a rub. And, you know, as we do this Moxley hangman thing, we try to buy our time till full gear. Um 
because what? Wheeler Yuta standing in the skybox behind MJF yeah, was, was gonna, just golden. I was going to say, let's get to the second part of this because it wasn't, it wasn't over when you thought you, it was going to be over because was it during the Moxley match? Yeah, it was after. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was during that match. And what you pointed out, you were like, you know, everybody thinks, oh, well, you run into the back. You're just going to get away from this guy. Yeah, I love when wrestlers, like, understand how wrestling works. Because for so much of, like, wrestling history, if you just made it to the back, you were fine. You were safe. Right? Like, <laughs> excuse me, like, nobody ever, the fight didn't keep going. Like, if I was fighting you and we went to the back, very rarely did we ever take a camera back there and show what was happening. Now, sometimes you would do it, but most of the time, they even did it during this thing with Jamie Hayter and Willow Nightingale in this episode of Dynamite. They just run to the they back and they just they just keep running. They disappear, right? So, like, I love that. Like Wheeler Yuta was just like, okay, MJF made it to the back. I want to kick this guy's ass. Oh, he's sitting up in a skybox. I bet I can just walk my ass up to that skybox and probably yeah. beat the shit out of him. And so, like, that's exactly what yeah. he did, right? Yeah, they did a good job framing that with the camera and stuff. Or like when wrestlers will like, you know, they do the thing where they're like in the middle of the ring. And somebody comes down the ramp to do a distraction, but they stop. But they can the wrestler can hear the crowd and know that somebody's behind them. So they just turn around and, and cut the the bad guy off before he's able to get a blindside shot in. Like, yeah. oh, I know how wrestling works. I can hear the crowd. Like, somebody's behind me. Let me turn around and throw a punch. You know? This was kind of like that. So uh, I like both these guys, Wheeler and MJF. They'll have a good match. Yeah. Um, and it, it's good to see this growth from Utah too. Like, he's not, he's not standing... He's not obviously standing toe to toe with MJF on the microphone because MJF is a one of one. Sure, right? but he's holding his own. He's not getting knocked out. Right, he's going twelve rounds, so that's good. I mean, you need that kind of improvement from these guys for sure. Yeah. So next up was uh, John Moxley versus Juice Robinson. I didn't I didn't know anything about Juice Robinson coming into this match. I just know he got crazy eyes and big hair. Juice Robinson is good, but again, like this is not the way. What is cool about his character is not his wrestling ability. It's his promo skills. Well, and it's I, it's the it's the rock hard Juice Robinson. It's that kind of stuff, you know, the the biker gimmick that he's got. And this is just like having him wrestle John Moxley randomly really doesn't paint him in his best picture. Yeah, I don't understand why they bring in people like him and they brought in Mance Warner and these dudes automatically get John Moxley. Like, what's the point unless you're going to sign these dudes? Which now the thing today too when uh this show talked about signing Roosh apparently Tony's made an offer to Bandito and said he's interested in signing Juice Robinson as well so I mean but why why do you give these dudes shots at your champ immediately Yeah, there's that and even like you know if you're gonna do this match let like why couldn't juice come out last week during grand slam or something or why couldn't we do this match next week and have this week juice robinson come out and cut a promo because that's where his like that that's where his skill set is the strongest bandito it makes sense yeah for him to just come in and like Put i don't know anything show. about bandito but like holy shit the moves and the wrestling is awesome and like he gets over that way that's not juice robinson is a fine professional wrestler but he's not he ain't doing Spanish flies off the top rope. He ain't doing these crazy luchador moves. He's got a cool gimmick, and he's got a cool promo, and he's got cool catchphrases, and he's kind of funny. Like, let him do that before you have a wrestling match. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just kind of weird. And the match itself was fine. Uh, both guys bled again, although it looks like not on purpose. So just like we're never – there's a good 95% chance in a John Moxley match somebody's bleeding. Somebody's going, going to get some color. Which – Again, it looked like this was inadvertent this time because it was in a weird spot. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it'll just always happen. But, yeah, I mean, the end of this, obviously, you get the showdown between Hangman and Moxley. And his Dolly Parton shirt. Love it. Yeah. And I, do they do – this is just throwing this out here. You know, obviously, there is a John Moxley – vacation at some point that is pending right right <laughs> like he he got to go fishing at some point yeah. get him on the boat so they have this match did he, did tony say it's october the 18th is that when it is in cincinnati it's a couple weeks away that sounds right do they do a thing where hangman actually beats moxley for the title mjf cashes in beats hangman for the title 
the firm beats down Moxley and kind of writes him off television so he can go on vacation. And then we do an we get an MJF versus Hangman little feud to then save MJF versus Moxley for at some point That'd down cool. the line. Yeah, I mean, I'd be good with that. Otherwise, I'm not really sure why you have Hangman win this battle, why you even do a battle royal in the first place. Because they didn't do it at last year at Grand Slam, did they? I don't think so. So they just they just made up this golden ticket thing. I, I don't really know why you would you just wouldn't do that, right? Or you, unless yeah. you shouldn't, you would just let it be MJF and Moxley. Unless it's a way to write Moxley off television faster. They need a writer, or it could be that we just don't know what we're doing. <laughs> like, but I mean that would be because because then you have Moxley and MJF in your back pocket that you can just at any time you can play that yeah. card. And put these two dudes in a ring for a month and let them cut promos on each other, and it'll be the best thing on television. Yeah. But, like, I don't know why. Like, where is Hangman? Unless this is literally just like a fuck you to CM Punk, which I guess it could be. I mean, it could be. Be like, hey, you call this dude a dumb fuck, but, like, we still think he's one of our biggest stars. and He is. Here he is in the ring, yeah. He still gets a pop. And they've done nothing. They've completely neutered that Hangman character. They've done nothing with him. Yeah. I mean, he's he won he won at Grand Slam, obviously, but like before that, what was he doing? Really, nothing. Yeah. So in a, in another instance of the crowd being fucking dead, um, Soraya comes out, does a promo. We did first of all, we didn't even get her name right when she debuted. Soraya. That's a that's a Excalibur called her Soraya, which is not right. I thought it was Soraya. I thought she said her my name is Soraya. What did Excalibur say? Soraya. Sor- Soraya. Yeah, that's what, yeah. And that's what we said. Yeah. So it's Soraya. Correct. And so they had to redub her little thing so that they could play it and use it in a video package where Excalibur doesn't fuck it up. Yeah. Oh, boy. Amateur. Like, we, I get they want to keep it a surprise, but could somebody not let, first of all, ask her, like, how do you say the name? <laughs> and then, hey, Excalibur, uh, Here's how you say the name. Here's a pronunciation guy. Why don't you keep this in your back pocket? Wink, wink. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so you don't have one a huge moment just get fucked up where you can literally. They literally can't use that moment. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> she know, had, she had to take a second and be like, "Hey, this is how you pronounce my name." Yeah, but like the crowd wasn't into it at all, and part of me was like, "Well, is it her or is it the crowd?" But then I was like, "Well, the crowd was fucking dead through the whole show." Yeah until the very end and at this point it hadn't been the very end yet and then so then they they had this match with Tony Tony Storm and uh, Serena Deeb which I don't even remember how it how, well wait a second the promo so the promo was weird first of all it was bad yeah absolutely bad whether you want to call it Russ whatever but like she's also coming from a company where she was always scripted so like is it is it part of like maybe it's going to take some work for her to come in and it could be that but again we talk about all the time right these competitors should have one singular focus and that is to become the champion i'm i'm confused as to why she's she doesn't feel like a wrestler she feels like a general manager and that yeah i mean they haven't made it clear um like if she's gonna wrestle why would she not be like hey tony you're great, but this is my place now, and I want that belt, so we're going to do it in three weeks or whatever. I mean, yeah, it looks like she's putting together a little stable with Tony, right, and a handful of others, but, like, they've given no indication that she'll wrestle other than some of the dirt sheets have said that her contract numbers imply that some wrestling would be involved. Right. Like, they're paying her a... A, a salary for somebody that wrestles and somebody that, that, that's not just a general manager. But I think part of the reason why the crowd was dead too was just because they're con- they're confused by like all this. They're like, wait, are you wrestling? Like if you're wrestling, why are you not like fighting some of these women? Yeah. Because now we've had two weeks where she's had no physical contact whatsoever. She wasn't even in the lumberjack match. She went up to commentary. And sure. First of all, her promo was straight dog shit like yeah <laughs> everything about it was awful <laughs> your name rhymes with Sh- yeah shit shit yeah. and they bleeped it and they bleeped, bleeped it, it yeah it and even like it. first of all you have Britt baker come out she does okay promo i mean 
it was fine. The, the whole segment was dog shit. Yet again, you got Tony Storm, you got Soraya, you got Britt Baker, you got all these women, and who is the crowd chanting for? Jamie Hayter. Like it's right. I don't know what the, what is the fucking hesitation. What are we doing? It is right there. <laughs> Just do it. Just make, help this girl out. She's what do you want her to do? Like she got the whole crowd. Yeah. over on her side and she's done nothing on television but just be the best women's wrestler in the division so why have they not turned her on brit yet like, i don't know what are they, what I'm, are they doing? I'm 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 floored by what the hesitation is because i you you pointed this out a few weeks ago when i noticed it the other night she when she's the only one of that group when there's four of them standing there that doesn't do the dmd exactly hand gesture there are some things that you should slow play right roman reigns and Sami Zayn, perfect example the crowd chanting for Sammy, they love him, but you're not going to do the turn yet because you got something in your back pocket where you're like, my God, we got this story, and when we do it, it's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. I highly doubt AEW has anything like that whatsoever for Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter, so just do it already. Like, you could have <laughs> had a thing where all the the babyface women come down into the ring with Soraya fucking Brit and her heels come out you have Jamie Hayter comes out by herself also why was there no Jade Cardgill why did she not come down is she just in her is she just in her own little world so she's taking basically Cody's spot Cody Rhodes' spot yeah. where he was in his own little universe and the rest of the show happened now that's just gone over to Jade <laughs> yeah cause like Jade had a feud with Diamante who we haven't seen on TV for months like a year yeah, but a long time she just has a random title match with her and then we bring out all the women on Dynamite and we're talking about this women's revolution and like one of our main champions isn't even on the show. Kind of odd. Again, this show needs writers. But like the crowd is telling you what they want you to do. Yeah. Just do that. <laughs> like, <coughs> hey, well, I guess, yeah, let's just do Jamie Hayter and versus Britt Baker. Like you can do more than one women's angle at a time. Sure. It's, it's not illegal. <laughs> You know, it's you can do it. You got two shows. You got two shows. You got multi, you got three hours of programming yeah. a week. Like they only really ever do one women's match per show anyway, right? Yeah, but you can. It, that doesn't mean there can only be like, one women's story. You could do two angles per dynamite, if not more. Whatever. We're if gonna, they're good, we're gonna get derailed on me talking about why Jamie Hader's fantastic. But like, I mean, <laughs> geez, I mean, everybody sees at this point. Everybody sees it. Yeah. Again, there's no reason to slow play this just turn out and do it uh but yeah the promo was awful but the match tony storm and serena d was really good again the crowd wasn't into it until the the finish the avalanche pal driver they got into it uh, but we've talked about how underutilized serena d is and this is the perfect way to utilize her like let her have a competitive match against tony storm you put tony storm over over as a champion She's a fighting champion. Here are all these challengers. She's going to take them on. She's going to do whatever it takes to win. She's going to do an avalanche pal driver, pull something out of her back pocket. Like, it's just great stuff. So, um, but yeah, the 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 Soraya stuff is. We we have to figure out something. I the, think the crowd has some just, work to do there. The crowd's just confused because they don't know if she's going to wrestle. Because if she can't wrestle, then they, then need, you they need, need to, to say draw that. a clear line. Yeah, and even if she can wrestle. You need to have, in storyline, somebody be like, she's not medically cleared yet, and so that way you have that expectation. Then she can say at some point down the line when she gets in a feud, to hell with it, I'll do a lights out match. I'm going to fight this person. Yeah. Something. Right now she's doing nothing. I mean, I think the move is you, you say on TV that she's not medically cleared, but then when she knows that she's cleared or whatever, then... Somebody could pop off and and hit her, and then it's like, oh shit, she, you know. Yeah, she's not and medically then that, cleared. That becomes a thing, right? Boom, boom. Yeah, she's not medically cleared. A heel comes up from behind her and hits her in the back of the neck. Boom, yeah. instant heat. Like right. Then something she's like fight. that. Yeah, and then she has to fight. Like this is, and if she isn't like in real life, not medically cleared, why the hell would you bring her in now? Yeah. Why not wait? Yeah, I mean, will she ever be cleared? Really. Well, I mean, you have to hope. You got to hope so, right? At some point, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know. I mean, I w I would think she is now if they brought her in. Because if not, then what are they doing? Otherwise, if you wanted to bring her in, I think she's still an asset. But the way you bring her in is like 
Tony does a little video announcement, and like he did a couple weeks ago with the he had to vacate the titles, and you're like, hey, Dynamite needs some more authority. I need another right hand person. True. To next week, we're going to debut Dynamite's first ever general manager, and it's and it's her. Yeah. You know. So the last match of the night, uh, we've already kind of kind of mentioned it: uh, Bandito versus Jericho. I didn't know shit about Bandito, and, and this was exactly what you said. You just bring this guy out to tear the house down. Yeah, and and finally got the crowd into it. I mean, there were a lot of really good spots there near the end. Um, you know, Jericho doing his thing with trying to take off the luchador mask and disgracing him and and all that. Uh, a couple of those top rope spots. He's just insane. Just awesome. Yeah, he's great. Really, great, really great good. all the way around. You would think these luchadors at this point. They got to look into like some mask technology, right? <laughs> like every 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 other match, somebody is like either trying to take it off or pulling it down in front of their eyes or something. You think at some point people would be like, "Hey, why don't I just like tie it up a little tighter or something like that?" <laughs> but yeah, Bandito's awesome. Like that's that's how you bring that guy in. You bring him in. You have Tony Shivani hype him up at the beginning of the show, and then at the end, you just. Have him get his, all this shit in, right? Kudos yeah. to Jericho for giving him that much offense. Yeah. But like, for Jericho being like, yeah, I'll take the top rope stuff and I'll take a hurricane on the floor. Like, yeah, let's, I'm game for it. Let's do it, you know? So let, let's let's wrap that part up and get to our uh, our Twitter prompt of the week. Um, well, what, what's the best wrestling entrance song? This was the one that you wanted to, to talk about. You give me yours first and, and I'll pull up a couple of these answers so while you're pulling it up unless somebody has come in late with the correct answer <laughs> i'm i'm disappointed in our listening audience and we have to we got to educate well, these do, people better. Do, wait do you want me to read all of these yeah uh, read them and off. then at the end you say wrong the answer is yes. like you did me yeah. today in the car we had to drive for a few hours and patrick would be like who what, what do you think is so-and-so's best song and i would name a song and he would go, wrong, it's this. And then <laughs> that happened two or three different yeah. times. So read off these things, and so, then I will give everybody the correct answer. All right, so so the first response was Blue Gillen, uh, faithful listener of the show. We appreciate you. Shout out. Uh, he says, currently, I got to go with Chris Jericho and Judas by Foxy. Oh, my God. Fozzy. Scar- so why did I say Foxy? I'm tired, y'all, by Fozzy. Overall, I would pick Stone Cold. And that shattering glass, such a great way to announce him and perfectly aligned with his character. So the Stone Cold, obviously, you're not going to get any uh, pushback from me whatsoever. <laughs> great glass shattering. It is so iconic. My man, Blue. <laughs> that Fozzie song. That, the Judas is awful. It's an awful song, right? I thought we were being ironic when we were singing it. Does, do people actually like the song? I think people like it. I ain't trying to be a dick in people's music taste or whatever, but... It's a, it's not a good song, right? Am I am I being I, the, am I the asshole here? Would I listen to it on a playlist? No. Do I have fun and sing along sometimes in my living room when I'm about two or three bourbons deep watching a show? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I do. So has, has people really like it. All right. I mean, I'm my I, bad guys. I don't like it. I think it's fun. I think it's a it's like a fun thing, but I thought we were all like in on the joke is like ha ha. It's yeah. not. I mean, it's kind of an ironic thing for cool. me. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you're not gonna catch me singing my 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 lungs out at the. It's a cool like now it is a cool dynamic like having the crowd sing along to it. Yeah, but like it ain't it ain't even AEW's best theme, <laughs> right? You know. Yeah, but you know, hey, we're everybody's everybody's different. So Chase Gilmer says, uh, Meta, Metalingus by Alter Bridge. On this day, I see clearly. Yeah, that's that one's fucking badass. That one hits me right back in my feels for my fucking childhood. Yeah, yeah he's that got, one's always going to be over. He, he's got a gift with Edge. Yeah. That looks pretty just, fucking badass. Edge is so damn cool. He's. I'm glad he's had this second run in his career coming back from the neck injury and he's on television again, but like... He kind of gets lost in the shuffle because that era was just dominated completely by John Cena. But Edge, man, was he was fucking badass. Yeah, I really Everything didn't know about shit him about, cool. about him until he came back. Was it a couple years ago? Came yeah. back in the Royal Rumble? Yeah. And uh, people lost their damn minds. Yeah, because he was one of the guys that was like, would sometimes get a win over John Cena. You know, Edge yeah. was a champion in there for a little bit. 
you know, Cena really had kind of like a Hogan-esque run where it was just like, you know, LOL Cena became the fucking meme of that time because he right. just always won. But like Edge was one of the guys that kind of broke through along with like Batista and some of those other guys like that. So yeah, yeah that one, that's a classic one for sure. So the Jeff at the Jeff says, uh, Heartbreak Kid, Stone Cold, all of Bray Wyatt's a million dollar man on the ground of most fitting for the character. Yeah, the Bray Wyatt ones is especially like they fit the character. The Shawn Michaels one too is just just a sexy boy. Sexy boy. I mean that's again, they're like classic <laughs> themes, you know. Um one of the things that all this pop so a good what makes a good wrestling entrance song? One, I think it needs to fit the character. But two, there are there is also like a formula to it. If you go listen like all the great wrestling entrance songs either have one of two things. They either have something like a the glass shattering effect where it just it happens. Stone Cold has it, The Rock. If you smell where you as soon as you hear it, you're like, oh shit, and the crowd yeah. gets up. Or it has like a a little bit of a lull at the beginning and about you know five to eight seconds in the, it kicks up and then that's when usually the wrestler walks out then all the shit goes off like that yeah. like uh i'm trying to think what would be an example of of that one well the edge one is a good example yeah. you think you know me dun, 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 on this day and then that's when he's out and the fucking shit's going off you know what yeah. i mean like so that's cool stuff so so jeremy satcher says watching wwe around the early 2010s um parentheses a dreadful period don't recommend uh, <laughs> i took some solace in yelling it's a shameful thing lobster head during the opening of the music uh seamus had at that time not especially great or even character fitting but it stands out to me <laughs> even now <laughs> That's a funny little story. Everybody's got little things like that, you know? That's pretty funny. Yeah. So, uh, Blaine Duncan, uh, head of the Alabama Take website, says, Hollywood Hulk's use of Voodoo Child's Slight Return always did it for me. I love The Undertaker's music, albeit not quite a song. Taker's music is iconic, obviously. Yeah. The Voodoo Child, Hulk Hogan, Hollywood Hulk Hogan thing was badass. Because he would come out playing the guitar. I never actually saw that one. Oh, man. I don't, I don't, do they... I haven't got to that point in WCW yet. I'm interested to see if the Peacock version will have the Jimi Hendrix entrance for Hulk Hogan when he turns heel. I'm a couple months away watching at that point. But yeah, he would come out to Voodoo Child and fucking play the <laughs> play the title like a guitar and shit. It's so, cool whenever they license music like that. Yeah. Like like Orange Cassidy right now has a really cool right. one that fits his character from was it Jefferson Starship? Yeah. Yeah. So so at Riggs Stevenson says uh, the Bushwhackers Titan Sean entrance video featuring Walkabout. So uh, we've had two Bushwhacker entrances now for or, or entries for our last two questions. I I'm that's your time. That's way before my time. The Bushwhackers yeah. were in the eighties, so yeah. I did not know the Bushwhackers were that popular. Bushwhackers were a thing when I was a kid. The only Bushwhackers thing I know, and I told you this when I saw the tweet, <laughs> was the it's the clip where one of them comes walking down for the Royal Rumble, you know, doing the little elbow thing. He gets in the ring. Somebody turns him around, throws him over the top rope. He lands and walks that way straight to the bag in all of like 30 seconds. Yeah. Like, that's the only Bushwhackers thing I know. And then Riggs follows that up by saying, and I'm with Blaine on the Undertaker's entrance to variations on Chopin's... Uh, is it Chopin? Is that how you say it? I don't remember. Uh, We're piano not that smart. Sonata at, <laughs> at number two in B flat minor. That's a, that's Blaine and his, you know, he's an English teacher, so he's smarter than both of us combined. So so I think that's all the answers on that one. Um, you've tweeted out some other things since then that have gotten some responses. So I haven't touched on the music yet. I, obviously, you got to go with uh, Stone Cold. Um, and don't laugh at me, but... I. I liked Cody's entrance music. I like Cody's entrance music. And then um, uh, I really like Ricky Stark's music, too. I was about to say, so let's talk about some current ones. Orange Cassidy has a cool one in AEW. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Starks, I think, is the best in AEW. Yeah. Kenny Omega is, is cool, too. Yeah, I don't know about Kenny's. You know, I think the Young Bucks music is pretty stupid. Um, it fits them, though. It, it fits, fits but I don't like it. Um, but yeah, I love I love Ricky Stark's entrance music. In WWE the Imperium entrance, the music is with the fucking white and the it's just it's 
perfect. I, I, since I haven't seen Roman wrestle in a while, which, well, I mean, I saw Mania this year, but I don't remember the music. He's, and I don't think the music is the same. Whatever music he was using several years ago was like real slow and brooding, like, don't know. Yeah, so that's the old Shield stuff. Dun. So he's okay. done with all that stuff. Okay, yeah, that he's music, got a new he's got a new badass. No, that music now. was fucking badass. Oh, you like the Shield? Yeah, the Shield was good, but like it didn't. At some point, it does kind of get a little bit old and repe- yeah. you know repetitive. Yeah, but he sure. no, he has new entrance music now. I think his new entrance music is better. I liked Moxley's music. I wish that he would go back to it and not use the Wild Thing anymore. I don't know the wild thing. I told you when that crowd all says wild thing in unison, it, that is yeah, that's but, something cool. But that fucking that dive guitar dive bomb that yeah that, yeah that shit was badass. Uh, I'm trying to think who else in WWE do I like? Uh, AJ Styles has some cool music. Yeah, it's I think it's still the same from what it was a, a while ago. Uh, going back to the, some classics. The Randy Orton, I hear voices in my head. Uh, perfect. There was that era where like they started licensing like songs or like having bands do it, and it was just great. DX stuff, the Attitude Era, Are You Ready? Yeah, break it down. Da-da-da. I mean, that's iconic stuff. Uh, there's one correct answer to this, yeah, though, tell, guys. Tell, tell us where we went wrong. Put it. Put it. Put it. It on. is three six mafia. Steam for Mark Henry. Somebody gonna get their ass kicked. That's the best. What are we doing? <laughs> Somebody gonna get their ass kicked. Somebody gonna get their wig split. Beat him up. Beat him up. Break his neck. That's the best one. What are we? I'm so disappointed. Nobody said that. Yeah, y'all really let Patrick down. We were driving this this morning, and he was like, "Okay, here's my number one song." Three six mafia. Uh, that is. That's it. Yeah, uh, y'all do better. Do better, guys. Uh, or maybe it's our fault for not edu- for not bringing the audience along with us. Well, I'll put the onus on me. I've failed. We have failed as a podcast to educate these people on some of the finer points of professional wrestling, like how Three Six Mafia's int- song for Mark Henry is the greatest wrestling theme song of all time. Also, you could say most underrated because nobody talks about it. Obviously, right? <laughs> uh, not in our uh, small meager following. <laughs> I mean, Stone Cold won, probably. If you're, if we're being completely objective here, and I'm taking, you know, my own personal taste out of it, Stone Cold. the Stone Cold Shattering Glass da, da, is, da, 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 da. yeah. Da, I mean, da, pe- da, people da, da, put that da, da, shit da, in like TikTok videos, so yeah. that just shows you how over that yeah. is. Or like the rocks, like if you smell. Yeah. Nobody said Triple H. Like that. That's <laughs> that song's great. Didn't he use Ace of Spades at one point? Or was that somebody else? He did use Ace of Spades for a little bit, yeah. But then he, yeah. Uh, I am the game, you know how to play it. <laughs> Entrance songs are important, though. I'm probably going to write about this in more detail, though. Uh, I, I'm right, working on a series right now where I'm kind of talking about different things in professional wrestling. I'm working on the first installment now, so hopefully you guys will be able to read it in like a week or two. Um but like an entrance song and a wrestler's entrance really does tell you a lot about them. First of all, it tells you how much stock the company puts in them. Because if you come back for commercial break and you don't even see that wrestler's entrance, like that's how you know that person's a jobber. Yeah. Like, oh, I didn't see them come out. They ain't got no music. This person about to get the hell bit out of them. Yeah. Or this company doesn't care about them, whatever. Well, like if you get them, usually the last sort of piece for somebody really ascending to like superstar status Get a new song. It is that new song or that new entrance? Wardlow, um, yeah, yeah, because he saw Wardlow get new music. Wardlow got new music. Like, you know, Goldberg wasn't doing the security guard knocking on the door when he first started. That came later because they were like, we're going to build this dude into a star. Like, we're going to give him something that nobody else is doing right now. That really is a big part of it because uh, it's that first impression when you walk out that tunnel. You know, you got two seconds to really showcase the audience if you're a star or not and and the production around it really helps you a lot so yeah um it is it is for as much as we like to debate you know what's the best it is really important to have like uh something that solidifies you as a as a superstar and not just stock music from uh you know yeah license royalty free music like royalty, the hardys yeah although the hardys thing you know with them <laughs> It was the music, but like, it was also their fucking their dress yeah. and the 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 weird neon lights and yeah. shit, you know. Like, and the yeah, everybody does the little <laughs> hand gesture. You know, you gotta have something. Yeah, you have to. Uh, and really, when you talk about 
the when people and especially when kids mimic wrestlers, a lot of the times what they mimic is the music is the is the entrance and the finishing move. You know, there's a dude from Nigeria that's gone viral, and all he does is just recreate wrestlers' entrances. Like that is a big part of it. You yeah, know? a lot of times when I'm watching it, when I'm watching AEW with my son. Darby Allen's music hits, and we'll just go, ah, for... Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the only part I remember that. Yeah. I don't remember anything yeah. else. I think AEW, that'll be the next step, of them really perfecting sort of the entrances. And not even just that, how the camera shoots it, right? Yeah. How, how you do camera I movements. I feel like it used to be a bigger thing, and now, like, because everybody had, like, moves and shit in their, yeah. their intros, and now it's just all, like their name with some flashy graphics because like or, a little, or some pyro you get a little bit of pyro yeah you know? but the, like now there's none of that like they, yeah. they stripped all of the moves out of like jericho had a big entrance that he used to do like a yeah. big video i do like that orange cassidy's is just like a white card with like black scribble on it yeah it says orange cassidy and it's like put a cool move here yeah <laughs> yeah it's great stuff Love it. kevin owens has a great one his his entrance right now in wwe is really <laughs> awesome and They've done it for the past couple of weeks. We're like, and they AEW has kind of done it with Wardlow, but I think they've shot away from going all the way with it just because I think some of their ticket sales might not be as great. Well, like WWE is pretty much running in front of sold out houses every single night. But the camera starts behind the wrestler and behind Kevin Owens as he walks out on the ramp. So the first shot you see is his hit behind him is from his back and like all the people right there and then the camera kind of comes around like i think really what we we haven't unlocked that element of like how do you broadcast wrestling and what's a cool way to do it with like longer takes and longer shots and maybe not so much like herky herky jerky cutting i think there's room here and really for aew i think they can be the ones that kind of can play on this and expand on it how do we shoot this in a different way to where we just look different from everybody else that's ever done yeah. pro wrestling in america i mean cody had a pretty significant entrance yeah he had the biggest one in aew yeah he's the only one that ever got to really come up in the center yeah <laughs> um but like even watching monday night raw this past week Sami Zayn and aj styles had a match and aj styles got thrown over the barricade and the ref is doing the countdown you know and he gets to eight and the camera's behind AJ, and the camera just follows AJ as he rushes in and tries to beat the count. And just that little moment of, like, yeah. those three or four seconds, you're like, yeah. oh, man, that was really cool because you've never, we've never really seen the camera kind of follow the wrestler like yeah. that as it goes all the way through, you know? So yeah. it's just, again, it's, it's minor. It seems like minor things, right? Yeah. But in totality, when you add this stuff up together, you really can make an imprint not only on how your product is is shown but how your audience perceives your product to be whether you're trying something different uh you know so there's a lot of room to play there i think so th- there's some good answers this week we appreciate y'all but you got to do better don't let patrick down next week <laughs> don't don't i gotta work with this man just don't let him down y'all we gotta we have to and spread the gospel of how awesome this go if you're listening right now when you get done with this podcast look it up it's on spotify it's on apple music Three Six Mafias, Mark Henry entrance music. Just go listen to it. It's awesome. Yeah, and uh, so let's 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 sign off. Unless you got any final thoughts for the week, it's been a long week. I'm tired. Long week. Let's let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Y'all follow us on uh, Instagram and Twitter if you don't already at Alabama Slam Pod. If you want to follow our network of other podcasts and writers, follow the Alabama Take uh, Alabama Take dot com or on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, any of the the socials. Uh, we've got other podcasts. We've got Check Your Shelf, a b- monthly book podcast. Uh, hosted by my lovely bride Jamie, um, taking on sports with TD Wood uh, is out. It's a weekly sports podcast. Uh, taking it down, pop culture podcast weekly with uh, Blaine Duncan, handful of fellas uh, and ladies involved with that. They talk about TV and movie and music, etc. And uh, my new Star Wars podcast with a couple of my buddies, uh, my best friends. Uh, it's called We Are a Star War. Uh, that's out now on all podcast platforms uh, and apps and things. Go check it out and uh, review us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called these days. We'd really appreciate that. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Hopefully uh, we'll have another good week of wrestling. I say good, even though this week was a little lackluster from, from Dynamite. 
Not from WWE though. Are we gonna become a WWE podcast? I don't know. I don't know. We'll Maybe see. Not. If it keeps happening. Y'all Roman versus it. Sammy. That's the main event. Let's get the word out. Honorary use, baby. Honorary use.